So, good evening, welcome, and thank you for joining us as we start wrapping up our 39th season of River Sticks. We will conclude the season next month with readings from the St. Louis Poetry Center, um, followed by our Hungry Young Poet series, and all that information is on those little bookmarky guys that you received on your way in. We thought that we were going to have uh, books by both writers, but apparently we had some kind of a foul up with between Left Bank Books and uh, Houghton Mifflin. So unfortunately, we only have books by Jazzy tonight, um, but apparently they can do orders and they uh, and do, uh, what are they called, signed? Book plates. Book plates, thank you, um, for Thomas Lux. Let's see, what else did I want to tell you? You know, usually I have a handwriting problem, and I think the problem is this is typed. So, um, let's see, we also have information about our annual poetry contest, which you can find out. Um, the deadline for that is May 31st. We have, for the first time, our Big River Writers Conference, which you can see right here. Um, if you have any questions about that, feel free to ask. Uh, you can also find some snarling dog decals right here at this table, uh, as well as River Sticks back issues. And these are really good for scaring off people who aren't like us and our ilk. So I recommend that you avail <laughs> yourselves to them. Oh, and before I forget, these readings are being recorded and archived on our website, thanks to a grant by Missouri Humanities Council. So, unless you want to be immortalized on the internet as a Philistine, Nimrod, or Luddite, please turn off your cell phone. This poet takes risks, says Jean Valentine, who selected Jazzy Danziger's debut collection of poetry for the 2012 Brittingham Prize in Poetry. And so she does, with language and voice, but with subject matter too, from dark family themes, including a mother's suicide, to unabashed joy and love and desire, as Jean Valentine continues, here are grief not formalized, joy, not smoothed out. The poems in Dark Room play with photography as a recurring motif, where images are blurred and confused by the act of memory. Images are overexposed or underexposed or haunted in double exposures by dark figures or subtexts lurking in the most ordinary dreams, landscapes, and still lifes. Jazzy Danziger was raised in Maitland, Florida and studied at Washington University and later at the University of Virginia where she was a Henry Hoynes Poe Faulkner Fellow in Poetry and also the editor of Meridian. Her poems, essays, and reviews have appeared in Virginia Quarterly Review, Meridian, The Rumpus, and a whole bunch of other places. She currently serves as editor of the Best New Poets Anthology. She lives here in St. Louis, Missouri where a couple of times now she's been a River Sticks hungry young poet, but now is a little older and hopefully a little less hungry. And we look forward to hearing some of her new work as well as favorites from her first book. Please welcome Jazzy Danziger. Thank you, Richard. That was a lovely introduction. And uh, I want to thank everyone at River Sticks for inviting me to read tonight and the Tavern for hosting us. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and an honor to read with Thomas Lux, who I have not introduced myself to yet because I'm nervous, <laughs> but I will eventually. Um, so it's great to be here and thank you. Um, I'm going to start with some poems from Dark Room. Uh, and the funny thing about reading from a, a book, of course, is that um, the book is already in the, the right order. And when you read excerpts, you take it out of that order and you pull it out of context and things become fuzzy and the story changes. Um, but uh, hopefully by taking these poems out of context, I'll inspire you to buy the book, <laughs> which is right out there. Uh, so I'm gonna start with a poem called Other Mothers. Something in the echo across the elementary schoolyard the way anemic Florida ice trembles and falls from science building gutters and smashes without fanfare. Worse than being alone is what being alone means. No one else's mother forgot today was a school holiday. No other mother dropped her daughter off and drove away. 
The child thinks of other houses, of baked bread in clean kitchens with calendars, with today circled in popsicle red Sharpie. She thinks of her mother, back from grocery shopping, falling in the garage, spilling oranges and bright bottles of liquor on the concrete floor, her pleated, her pleated skirt spread out and soaking. The dazzling fury of that body, the way it can blame you for its own mistakes. The girl will be in trouble whatever she does. Her voice would crack this chill, the electric cold, even the smallest squeak or hum, and she can feel the wooden spoon on her behind, the back of her head, whichever bodily arch offers itself up as she cowers flat on the linoleum. She stands in the parking lot. She wonders what she can do to save herself. What is the proper way to be saved? Clutching the braided hat on her head, 15 minutes of writhing before she begins to howl. Help, she screams. Someone, please, I don't know what to do. And soon is heard through the glass of a donut shop well down the street. The owner scuttles out to her shouting, what's wrong, what's wrong? And she is red and wet from her crying. He takes her hand across the street, lets her call her mother from the phone in back, which hangs so high, he must dial for her. No one answers. He gives her a French cruller, round, ring-like on wax paper. He has cinnamon on his hands. All the patrons are made of coffee and smoke and aquanet. For now, she is allowed to nap, to disintegrate onto a hard orange booth seat, like fine sugar onto a pastry mat. So let's move on to fathers, perhaps. Uh, this is the psychiatrist's teen daughter self-evaluates. <coughs> there are two kinds of people in the world, those who wear pants and those who tolerate them. My aversion to pants was at first rooted in an unhealthy gender bias. As a six-year-old, I found them unwomanly, horrified by the women who came into my grandmother's salon in anything but a skirt. But puberty transformed the cause of my distaste. A good pair of pants is unforgiving on a girl with hips. I learned this at Abercrombie and Fitch. There are two kinds of customers in that world, those who eat and those who are assisted by sales girls. A lot of my anxiety revolves around appearance, and it seems that I'm unhappy with either person I know how to become, the one who's looked at and the one who's invisible. When I was 13, Isabella Lombardi taught me how to get a boy to approach you in the mall. Make eye contact as he comes at you, lock your gaze on him, then find a bench and sit down. There are two kinds of boys, she said, those who follow me and those who follow me. <laughs> in other words, she never failed. I failed without her, though, and one rainy night, when we were riding in the back of Isabella's dad's Jeep, my father called and said, there were two types of girls I could choose to become, the girl who calls her father or the girl who ends up in a ditch. He didn't mean it to come out so bad, but I hadn't phoned in two days. I remember the school production of Little Shop of Horrors. There were two kinds of students that night, those who sang and danced, and those who set off the fire alarm. Isabella was the latter, and she wasn't allowed back to classes. Three months before my mother died, she bought me a silver dress that was too small for me. She didn't know this before she said, you'll look like Miss America, since there are two ways to measure a daughter's size, through the forgiving lens of love and through the pucker of an unforgiving fabric. She couldn't get the zipper up, so I said, you try it on, and she wouldn't, because she knew it would fit. One afternoon, she was looking at gold necklaces in Mayer's Jewelers in the mall while I sat at a wrought iron table outside of the door, sipping a milkshake. Four boys came up as if I was Isabella. I hadn't even looked at them. They called me Mama. They asked for my phone number. I was scared, but my mother turned around, saw us, and shooed them away. I was both of the two girls I could be in that moment, the frightened and meek young girl and the child who wants her mother to know someone else has found her baby beautiful. Um, that was published in, uh, in 2010 in an anthology, weirdly enough, uh, published by Modcloth, which is an online um, clothing 
company. Um, and they asked me before publishing it to, to take out the Abercrombie & Fitch line, which makes sense. They didn't want to insult a fellow retailer. But um, it really upset me, because I loved that dig. And uh, and I, I just, as I was rereading this today, I just take comfort in the fact that that Abercrombie & Fitch reference just seems more and more dated as the years go on. So, yeah. Um, OK. This is Horseshoe. Mrs. Rivera and her son were fighting in the kitchen. Idiota, she said, spooning out clams and yellow rice, like La Rubia, that friend of your sister's. That was the end of her pet name for me. She forgot that I lay barefoot, belly down, one room over, barely seven. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry, she said when she heard me cough. But the family continued the teasing all winter. They'd remind me of my sick mother, of the neighborhood kids discovering I didn't know Silent Night or the meaning of the lamb. I'd asked why plastic sheep were grazing on the lawns all December. One morning, the Riveras made jewelry for their children. They covered the good dining table with wires, beads, and wax charms. We stood in clusters at each corner. The father's black curls bounced with each clip of the pliers. He looked at me, held up two necklaces. One held a horseshoe charm, blue and waxy. The other, the addition symbol, uneven, long, the cross. I knew nothing but its shape, bisecting lines that pleased them, this family that could rise from bed, meet for meals, crinkle tissue-thin Bible paper with their fingers. This family, sometimes their house was all I had. Their father asked me which necklace I preferred. I pointed to the one the other children wore. They laughed, all of them licking their mouths, the mother howling, Rubia, take the horseshoe, your mother will prefer it. Months later, Mrs. Arlen down the street was offended by the Rivera children. She swooped in, her red hair piled high like leaves, her massive body sweating, her face shiny and wet, the mouth opening to tell Juanita that if she rammed her bike against their dumpster again, she'd tell her mother on her so fast it would make all our heads spin. To be abused so by an adult, the fear could manifest only in laughter, a great mock joy hiding the new knowledge of our smallness. We echoed the phrase for weeks, me twisting my head so far around owl-like that sometimes I thought it would leave blood red bruises on my collarbone. This is Dark Room, title poem. The body erased, light birthing the image. The hand's obstruction removes an eye, a rib. It happened this way. The soft infrareds, not red, but black, engraved in the colloid, the choked look of the projector, the jam-capped reds of filters and their choice of contrast intensity, darker and darker, the sooted blood, color deciding how white is your white on gloss or matte, this power trip and scare. We were looking inside the grain, wrenching the focus knob, the negative sharpened but observed through mirrors. This could have been creation. The tendon and mouth, blank of the background, bound in the space were seen. Halide silver and dirt clinging, separating, finding the natural shape. Then we had our desires and tricks of the hand and light. We made our demands. So the salts formed the backs of spoons or fish scales or human smoke and images in silver that were not silver a few teeth flashing in the soil. We mangled our subjects after the shot, technique hushing the grain. The body had its hunger and its words, the agitations and stop baths, the vinegar and burn and fingernails blacked, our brutal selves reeling, the strips onto spools, the world made new and blooming and dumb. This is from the, the natural disaster section of the book. Uh, this is called Her Grandfather Filling the Bathtub Before a Hurricane. She watches as he stops the drain, twists the acrylic, 
fills the yellow tub. His horse shivers in his picture, in his picture frame, watches from the hallway. The barometers are dropping, and this room and its parts, glossy black sinks, little soaps, drawers lined with flowered paper, lipstick, lipsticks chalking with age, a fine powder on everything, and a light switch cover where a leering man with a mustache opens his coat for them. Her grandfather dips his hands in the water, tests the temperature, but no one will be bathing. She knows he cleans the city's teeth, files incisors, files folders for young boys and their bub bubblegum alginate. Watch how they hide from the rain. Watch now at the bathroom mirror as he distracts her from the sky, asks to see her bite. After the tub is full, he washes her hair in the sink, combs it like plowing. The dark circle snaps the lines, blacks the house, and now the wind is tossing trees, rounding the uprooted palms, each bloodless trunk, a bow scraping the strings of power lines, all hot weather their song. And now she sees each domestic act and its sad foundation, like his twisting of the knob and its impulse, threat of groundwater filth, electric loss, the cooling of the stoves, no way to burn themselves clean. Just one more from Dark Room. This is the discarded. A shutter held open long enough can capture most things, widened toward light, waiting for enough of it, waiting to close. A girl and a boy in a Jeep enter a cornfield in the dark. She makes a loop in his flannel shirt, instinctive clutch, the kind newborns know. What can she expect Seen through his small aperture, his iris a rough f-stop. Their courtship in this way is willed to be longest, thickest of exposures. In the low light, if her bare arms were lit, you'd see their lines on the print, slow wrap around his back. And the wheel hard stopped, growing sugar black in its constant position. Likewise, his disinterested place in the bucket seat. Sometimes he tells her she is pretty, with his hands in her hair, how he'd like to spend a few years making sandwiches for her in a kitchen, the quaint linoleum kind, how he'll lovingly wash and shake dry her lettuce, slice the bread into cat's ears every day, a baby crow out the window, daddy crow waiting for mellow scotch pie, boiler of syrup, butter, yolk, his hand over her hand on the hot aluminum handle, really, he does not want these things doesn't even want anyone to know he's here with her. Just wants that open part. For her, it is the world. For him, it is the car in the field. After curfew, families down the road drawing the farmhouse blinds, and her weak heart rehearsing silently the half-truth she'll offer when he's been dodged from her print, light blocked from that world. Well, we did nothing but talk. I kept myself ajar, but I couldn't capture a thing. Uh, some new poems. These are always fun to read. Uh, this is uh, Zofdig, Manhattan, which is not a place in Manhattan. <laughs> Maybe in my mind. I collapsed down the stairs toward the platform. My raincoat burst loud as a wire and plaster frame. And no expectation of a gasp or a stranger's hand as rain choked the concrete steps, delaying the train. No one to pull my broad body out of the station. That summer, the Jennifers and Ellens were wafer thin, and each beauty store window was lit like a lantern, glowed like a furnace. The wigs at Ricky's NYC, a bison eye cream in the brick walls of the original Keels, and me slathering my body in argan skin salve before dinner those greased plastic wraps at Blue Nine Burger. I wanted to wear a tarp around my waist, my breasts, my face. Wanted them to stop calling me Jessica. Wanted not to have made this mistake. I fell. I leather belted myself up, shaped my body to hide the curves, the wounds. Plasmatic suspended light in the subway car each morning. Me chirping, make room please, make room. Hapax. 
With you, there were words I couldn't avoid repeating. Dark, ice, milk, and the Hebrew for fought, akut, its sole appearance in psalms. Fought, I could say, and corrugated as in your heart, the sweetest parts hidden in the grooves. Once I wanted to unfold you, find the word no one else could read, the word forever crawling back. Who were you then? All around you now, the smell of flood. What seemed a night sky is a scratchboard underfoot. I can't promise to say this only once. The red circumference of a skirt seduced you. Now you know what it means to be ashamed of want. An empty vessel can hold you. Something hollow will echo your own voice back to you. It would have been different if you loved a creator. This is CNO. This is a Villanelle. And I do that because I broke a lot of rules, which is fine. It's fine. Uh, CNO is uh, the name of an old, uh, an old rail line that ran through Charlottesville, Virginia. <clears throat> a hot question unanswered, a blank space that hung over husband, over wife, in a sour mash rain. In my body, I knew every song that we'd sung. What you loved was our ghost, an old stone on your tongue, two Blue Ridge bound drunks begging rails for a train, and no question unanswered, and star charts that hung every kiss, every play in what play could become, and your pretty hands sieving strange buckets of grain. I knew every song had been sung. What lies did we tell to love quick and love young? What wish was the wish our lies couldn't sustain? Cracked questions, ignore them. There's cheap art to be hung while black bricks build the flu, and the flu foils the lung, and I pin up my hair and you pop flat champagne. In my body, I knew all our songs had been sung. When your face turned to fever and our two lives, unstrung, split, split crooked and graceless, and creaked to complain, that bad question was answered by the white wall that hung, a whole future unmade, and bright songs left unsung. And this is Even Here, which is the, the poem that appeared in the uh, VQR Insta Poetry series. And then, of course, as soon as it was published, I decided I hated it and rewrote it. It's fine. It's out there. Uh, even here. In another life, my love is a house. My love is a salt box you visit at night, lemon lit, squat, fat with glass. My vision has not corrected. I paw out these contacts and we tumble to bed. Highway dark and hum floods the room. Stars thaw wet, a melt as long and sleepish as our lives. And it is better not to see. Even here, you are a ruined landscape that I love and can't not, still blinded by love. So this is, this is the last one I'll read, and it's a uh, St. Louis love song. I love my city. Look at her in this light, the high arc of her bridge, her river wrapped in woozy frost. Now back she rolls, called back by ghosts and gilded bells, back by aftershocks that ring still through steel-pinned joints, by the memory of fever and its flush of brick burned red, by her river reversed. If I were to leave her, her cold caves and blues, her lick of leaves, her rattle would follow in shivers that collapse the church of a dream, in murmurs that unwind the fine fibers of a heart. Who are you, you who dies and returns, who comes back in beauty and becomes to me like a bone? Thank you. We're going to take a very short break, maybe uh, five or ten minutes, and then we'll be right back with Thomas Lux. So, and by the way, remember Jazzy has books for sale right outside that uh, door.
It is my great pleasure to introduce to you Thomas Lux. Thomas Lux has taught at the universities of Iowa, Michigan, and California, Irvine, and many others. His recent books of poetry include God Particles, The Cradle Place, The Street of Clocks, and New and Selected Poems, 1975 to 1995. His latest book, Child Made of Sand, was going to be available here for purchase, but you can order it, courtesy of Left Bank Books. Thomas has been a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Award in Poetry and has received three National Endowment for the Arts grants and a Guggenheim Fellowship. He currently serves as the Bourne Chair in Poetry at the Georgia Institute of Technology. I'd like to tell you some of the things that Thomas writes about, and the easiest way to do that is to read to you some of the titles of his poems. A Frozen Ball of Rattlesnakes, A Delivery of Dung, The Goldfish Room, Where the Cops Beat You in the Head with a Phone Book, Men with Small Heads, Somebody's Aunt Out Swabbing Her Bird Bath, Walt Whitman's brain dropped on laboratory floor in Hitler's slippers. Of course, those aren't the things they're really about. His poems, no matter how absurd or sobering, lead us towards something fiercely beautiful. They're wry, without pretension, about as boring as poking a hornet's nest. And in each one, there always runs a white thread of grace. In Refrigerator 1957, a poem in his new and selected collection, he writes about a jar of maraschino cherries that sat uneaten in the refrigerator his entire childhood. He speculates about its significance in his family's history and about its possible significance in his future, and he ends with this. They were beautiful, and if I never ate one, it was because I knew it might be missed or because I knew it would not be replaced, and because you do not eat that which rips your heart with joy. Another favorite poem of mine, and perhaps the first Thomas Lux poem that I ever came across, is about a man who hangs upside down on an overpass to spray paint a sign to his beloved, and he misspells it sweatheart instead of, sweet <laughs> instead of sweetheart. And it's a beautiful love poem, and I'd love to read it to you, but it would be silly for me to read to you a Thomas Lux poem when we have Thomas Lux himself here to read to you Thomas Lux poems. So please join me in welcoming him to the podium. Thanks. Wreck the place. Thank you, Kim. That was a very thoughtful and generous invitation. Uh, introduction, and it was a generous invitation to in invite me here. I've, I've been aware of reading River Sticks for 30 years or something like that. It's just always been one of the, the class small literary magazines in the country, so uh, congratulations. 30, I didn't know it was that long, 37 years? That's incredible. Some of you are not 37 years old uh, here, <laughs> but that's incredible. But I'm, I'm, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And Jazzy, that was uh, terrific. Uh, I think I told you uh, that Jean Valentine was my dear friend. Uh, I don't see her much anymore, but she was my colleague for many, many years at uh, Sarah Lawrence. And uh, Alice Anderson on the back of your book was a student of mine uh, there at Sarah Lawrence uh, College. It's a small world. I'm going to read one poem from my last uh, two books, and then I'm going to read uh, uh, some new poems uh, for you. This is called The Moths Who Come in the Night to Drink Our Tears. The moths who come in the night to drink our tears always leave quenched, though they're drinking, in composition, seawater, which does not make them insane, as it does parched humans when we drink it, even with our big, big bodies. If you knew the leper's tears do not contain the bacillus leprae, would you let him weep on your chest? Let the moths come. Let the sand woman and man come. Let Morpheus and Dreamadum come unto me and my beloveds. Let the moths come and drink of the disburdening waters. 
And this poem is, uh, this book is uh, God Particles, and it's, uh, the poem is called The Joy Bringer. The Joy Bringer. Does it sound good? Is it too loud? Uh, sometimes I get too loud, people tell me. The Joy Bringer. The Joy Bringer brings the light through the oak leaves at dawn. The Joy Bringer injects the red birds red. The Joy Bringer brings the green, lets the cup runneth over into a saucer from which you can sip. Gives fish the river, the river the fish. If by two inches you avoid a piano falling on your head and later at the hospital fall in love with a doctor who removes a few splinters of ivory and black piano lacquer from your left cough, calf, the joy bringer arranged that. Also, the chilled artesian water spilling from a pipe only two inches above the ground from which you drank on your hands and knees on a few boards or branches you bowed in the muck and drank that sweet cold reaching up you drank among the skunk cabbage ferns a small brook at your back. Again, guess what? The joy bringer. In fact, let us praise the joy bringer for these seven things. One, right lung, two, left lung, three, heart, four, left brain, five, right brain, six, tongue, seven, the body to put them in. Thank you, joy bringer. And thank ye, thank ye too, for just moan hay, cut an inch from its roots to bleed its perfume into the air. I just noticed there's a red bird in that, a red bird red in there. I wasn't thinking of the St. Louis Cardinals uh, when I wrote that. And as a Red Sox fan, I have to apologize to you for uh, taking you out last September. But I still am hurting from 1967 when you took us out, but then we, then we got you twice since then, I think. So, yeah. People, uh, you know, sometimes ask me, why, how do you become a poet or why or whatever? And I say, because I was a Red Sox fan as a child and I spent every, every year humiliated and defeated <laughs> and, and uh, uh, withdrawing into myself and uh, stuff like that. And there's some truth to that. Uh, but now we won three World Series in the last decade. I hope that, that doesn't mean I'm going downhill. We'll see. I'm going to try these new poems. I have seven or uh, eight of them. I've been writing a lot of uh, odes, uh, praise poems, gratitude uh, poems, and uh, uh, this is one. It's called uh, Ode, to the East, Ode to the Eating Establishment Where the Utensils Were Chained to the Table. <laughs> Ode to the Eating Establishment Where the Utensils Were Chained to the Table much like the pens at the post office or a bank. I'd never had reason to enter a bank. I bought a stamp once. I stood in line with two dimes and some pennies, though not many. More than a stamp, I wanted a pencil so I'd feel like I went to school. Those were difficult times. There were different rules. Often, I dined at the above establishment. One was permitted to bring one's own spoon. I didn't have one, but hoped to soon. Nevertheless, I ate my belly full. I was a young man, and I walked out into the green trumpet of morning. This is called Ode to the Joyful Ones. It has a quote, uh, protect your joyful ones which I, I, I had it in my notes, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it's from the, from the Bible or maybe the Anglican prayer book. I'm not sure. I've got to track down where it's uh, from. Maybe I tried to even Google it. I've only Googled things about three times in my life, and uh, I tried to Google that, and it didn't uh, come up. But protect your joyful ones. Ode to the joyful ones. That they walk, even stumble among us, is reason to praise them or protect them. Even the sound of a lead slug dropped on a lead plate, even that, for them, is music. 
because they bring laughter and fleeting amnesia, its cousin. Because they stand talking, taking pleasure in others with their hands on the shoulders of others and on each other's shoulders as well. Because if there are two pork chops, they will give you the better one. Because you don't have to tell them to walk towards the light. Because they will give you the crutch off their backs. Because when there are two of them together, their shining fills the room. Because you don't have to tell them to walk towards the light. This is not an ode, or I'm not calling it an ode. Uh, it's called onomatomania, uh, which is a word for the, the inability to find uh, the right word, uh, which is something that all of us who are uh, writers, poets, uh, struggle with. <coughs> this poem, every once in a while, every three, four, five years, there's, a, there's an article somewhere in a, in a magazine about poetry is dead. Uh, poetry is dead every, every five or so years. It's only been alive for about since guys were chanting around fires and caves, but every once in a while somebody declares it's uh, dead. And this poem was kind of a response to that. But the best response to I ever heard to that kind of uh, article uh, was by Donald Hall, and he was responding to somebody who wrote that article. This was several years ago. And he says, it's not poetry that's dead. It's you that's dead. Uh, because you don't, uh, you know, when we're young uh, and you fall in love with uh, certain poets, uh, it's never like that again. You, you never, and you're never young again. Uh, poetry uh, doesn't change so much, I don't think. We, we do change, but I think that was the best answer. He said, you know, uh, you, you're the one who's changed, not, not poetry. You're, you're not young anymore. You don't, you don't have the passion for language anymore. And, uh, and the same poets you fell in love with then, they're, they're different poets now. Uh, and, and it's just not going to happen that way. But to me, it's kind of absurd to say poetry is dead. It's, uh, it's been around for, for centuries, and it still exists uh, in, uh, in, in cultures without a language, uh, only without a written language. Uh, every single culture on the face of the earth has developed uh, a poetry of their own. They didn't learn it from other cultures. Every single culture on earth through, in the history of the world has, has their poetry which to me means there's something uh, necessary about it. Uh, it's not a luxury. It's as necessary as bread or air. So I'm kind of responding uh, somewhat uh, satirically to that kind of attitude, onomatomania. Onomatomania, the word for the inability to find the right word, leads me to self-diagnose. Anomatomaniac. It's not the 20 volume OED I need, nor Dr. Roger's book, which offers synonyms only, never discovery. I accept the fallibility of language, its spastic elasticity, its Jake leg, as well as prima donna dances. I accept that language can be manipulated towards deceit. For example, the Mahatma propaganda, i.e. Goebbels. I accept and mourn, though not a lot, the loss of the dash semicolon pair. It's the sound of a pause unlike no other pause. And when words are tedious and tedious also their order, well, sew me up in a rug and toss me in the sea. Language is dying, the novel is dying, poetry is a corpse colder than the Iceman. They've all been dying for thousands of years, yet people still write, people still read, and everyone knows that nothing is really real until it is written. Until it is written in a book. Even those who cannot read know that. The part in the middle about uh, the Mahatma propaganda and Goebbels, uh, that poem was printed somewhere recently. I got a nasty note from a guy. Uh, he said he stopped reading the poem when he got to that uh, point. Uh, uh, but Goebbels was Joseph Goebbels, of course, the Nazi propaganda minister. 
uh, and uh, and he was cynically referred to by uh, uh, journalists, particularly American journalists, uh, English, etc. Because if it was German journalists, they would have got a bullet in the back of the neck. But uh, he was. They called him the Mahatma propaganda. It was a sarcastic thing, but uh, somehow this guy uh, took it wrong and. Uh, and wrote me a nasty letter and, and stopped reading the poem at, at, that, uh, at that point. He was a doctor, too. I, so I wanted to write, I never respond to stuff like that, but uh, I wanted to say right back, I'm glad I'm not your patient. <laughs> you only look at half the body. <laughs> Maybe he specialized in like the lower half or the bottom half, the top half of the body, I don't know. This has a Latin title, which I, I translate in the, in the title, Nullius in Verba. Take nobody's word for it. Uh, don't recall reading that in high school Latin class. If implicit could be nailed to the wall, it was implicit. You took the teacher's word for it. I was a poor student and needed extra tutoring. On Saturday mornings, a defrocked priest in the family drilled me at his mother's house. Nullius in verba never came up. I required help with algebra, too. I didn't believe an X could equal a Y. I still don't. In fact, I believe algebra is a conspiracy of what and by whom I can't say here, but I have proof. <laughs> Latin, at least, is a language, a good language, and it isn't dead. Read Catullus. Take my word for it. It isn't dead. So I start the poem by saying, take nobody's word for it, and then say, take my word for it. This is called Lobato Mobile. Like a bookmobile uh, uh, but, uh, for lobotomies. Lobotomobile. It works to sell cold and creamy things. You hear the bells after supper, time for the music of the children's throats. One kid across the street never had a dime. Who said there once was water enough for boats? Who told me there existed a thing called bookmobiles? I saw a book once. When I touched it, it turned to dust. There was no rag man. There was a bone man on a bicycle with a basket. And bloodmobiles, remember them? During the night bombings, you see them every day. The knife grinders came by cart in summer by sled in winter. I knew a milkman once, white milk truck. Fred, the bread man's wagon, was the smell of dawn. During the fever years, inoculation vans drove the wrong way on no-way streets. Toot, toot, ding, ding, here, over here, to the Lomato, Lomatomobile, Lobatomobile, it's hard to say, to the Lobatomobile, should those wanting to be numb come. <laughs> It's another one of these odes called Ode Elaborating on the Obvious. It's a miraculous apparatus, consciousness, even blinking off and on, even on a mattress as pre-coffin. I ate the pudding once from a plastic tray of lunch a kind nurse served my father. He didn't want to eat it or anything. A friend wrote that he found Jesus. A friend, a friend wrote that his wife is dying. The friend who wrote he found Jesus wrote again that he lost Jesus. He was just here and now he's gone. My friend whose wife is dying did not write to say that his wife is not dying. Here's a nice sound. If they're two leafy blocks over at the schoolyard, children. This is something I like to look at. Thick yellow brush strokes. I love to whiff winter's cilantro snows. The taste of choke cherries bitter breaking on my tongue. 
I loved to touch my child's head for fever and the feeling of finding none. This is called uh, Ode to the Eraser as Big as a Bus. Uh, it has a, well, I'll read the epigraph after I, I read the uh, poem. Ode to the Eraser as Big as a Bus. Thank you for the relief, the rest, for having only palimpsest and a little rolled orange eraser dust and not the XXXXX of a stitched up scar when you came to do what erasers do. The way you rubbed out in one wide swath the memory of that place 6,000 miles away. Most of us have never heard of it until we saw a monk set himself on fire and sit there serenely in the center of the flames until he fell over. Why'd he do that, my friend said. We were in high school in a town like thousands of towns. We were glad to be American, and I mean no irony. My friend also said the only thing our town lacked was an ocean. We found one 101 miles away. Thank you for erasing the next years in that distant place, erasing a million people living there, erasing how many thousands I lost count along that black wall of people living here who went there, some of my friends and yours and those who return. We know some who were strafed by the chemical that turns green to orange, now with electrodes in their brains and their bodies cluster bombed with tumors. The epigraph is, uh, of course, that poem is about Vietnam, but uh, the war that so many would like to forget and so many others refuse to remember. That was from a book called uh, Kill Anything That Moves by a guy named Nick Tercy. Remember the boxes on the newspapers, those who are old enough every day during the Vietnam War up in the corner on the front page of the paper, the, uh, the death counts every day for years. Oh, to the pig rolled from the castle down a hill to where the peasants wait with axes. The least fat of the king's fat swine, you were the last to reach the king's sow's teats, and later your brothers and sisters climbed over your back to feed on slop. Excellent slop, the king's table slop, but slop. So it's you they've tied in a ball and kicked down the hill to feed and appease the peasants. Since you are of the swine family, if you were fatter, you might have appeared on the king's table. Since you are of the swine family, you are oblivious regarding the difference. We worship you for that, as do the peasants with axes. <laughs> Kind of a, the trickle-down theory of uh, economics. <laughs> oh, to the fat child who went first onto the thin ice. Oh, to the fat child who went first onto the thin ice to test it for three of us about a dozen feet behind. He was a big boy and could have broken each of us had he chosen to. Instead, he was a good big boy whose mother loved him and called him Pumpkin. It was on a pond, once a source for the, for the frozen water trade, and at this part, Ice House Beach, the thickest, the latest to thin, everyone said. Early spring of a hard winter. On the opposite shore, there were some woods we wanted to enter, a shortcut home. <coughs> He disdained a rope we'd brought for such occasions. He went forward about 10 feet. We went back about 10. <laughs> at mid-pond, he called, come on, one at a time, it's plenty. We were back on the beach by now. 
He crossed to the other side and called again, but while his back was turned, we were gone, going the safe, the ingrate way. Thank you very much. So as many of you veterans of our reading series know, we started doing this uh, Q&A thing at the end. Um, and I thought I would ask the first uh, question to get the ball rolling. So it occurs to me that both of our poets tonight uh, are not afraid to go to dark places uh, in terms of, of, of loss um, or death or heartbreak. So I was curious about the idea of redemption. And I was curious where you stand in relation to redemption, uh, if anywhere, in your work. So. Redemption? As in a religious sense? No. Oh, uh, well, any kind of making of a piece of art, any kind of piece of, any kind of act of creation uh, is by nature an affirmative act, is a positive act, is against uh, destruction or, or death. So if there's any redemption in, in writing about uh, the dark things, the troubled things of, of the world, uh, of which there are plenty, uh, it's it, it's in trying to make try to make a piece of art out of it. Uh, uh, it doesn't make the the horror go away, uh, but it but it maybe helps us uh, live with it a little bit a little bit better. But that's the only kind of redemption I can uh, think of. Uh. <laughs> Uh, you know, one of the central things that, that I think Darkroom deals with is, um, is uh, making art an act of creation or destruction. And I think it's still a question that I'm, um, you know, grappling with. Um, I don't know. A better, a better answer for that. Um, Maybe I should ask a better question. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm, I guess redemption is something I'm... I'm working towards, but uh, it's sort of you know still still out there. I don't know, but the the working towards it is um, is pleasurable and and in its own way uh, worth worthwhile, I suppose. Maybe I should have started with a little clarification. I was thinking of that Philip Larkin poem called "This Be the Verse." Do you guys know that? They fuck you up, your mom and dad. They may not mean to, but they do. They give you all the faults they had, and that's redemption just for you, sure. But they were fucked up in their turn by fools in old-style hats and coats, who half the time were soppy, stern, and half at one another's throats. Man hands on misery to man. It deepens like a coastal shelf. Get out as early as you can, and don't have any kids yourself. <laughs> we can do that, a duo of this. But it, it occurs to me in, in that poem, in particular, there's really no redemption. I mean, get out as early as you can, and don't have any kids yourself. And I, I, as, as a poet who, who also likes to go to often the dark side, it occurs to me the only redemption in that is the fact that it's humorous. And it's sure. funny because it's not supposed to be. So there are different ways of taking redemption. Yeah. Is that... That's exactly help? what I'd say about that poem. That's, that's it's a redeeming value that it's funny and you can't take it totally, totally seriously. He's not telling, he doesn't really believe that nobody should ever have any more kids again. He doesn't believe that totally and it is funny. Uh, and it's also a minor history lesson in Victorian uh, uh, history and how people were and what, what he grew up as a child, his parents in, in England. It's a, it's a history lesson, uh, that poem. Were there more questions? Uh huh. I'm just kind of following up on your question. Um, a lot of your work is very funny, and some of it in yours too, you know, deliberately so, um, and dark. But tonight you were reading poems about uh, take, you know, to protect your joy bearers, protect your joy bearers. Yeah. Um, the and then the last line of the last poem you, you read, what was it again? Just the very last one. It was a. Uh, <laughs> uh, which one I read last, exactly. The, 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 the fat the child, breaks. yeah, the fat child, who, who yeah, goes on the you ice. You know, we, as ungrateful, in breaks. And you're, you seem to be celebrating being grateful in a lot of the work that I you hope so, tonight. yeah, I hope and so. I guess my question is, do you think to some extent, is there any, 
Oh, no, I've always been obsessed with death and stuff like that well, since I was five years part, old. The, 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 the understanding that you need to protect some of the joy givers. Uh, Is that a change? I don't th th I, that might have something to do with uh, getting old, but I think I've always had that, that kind of uh, instinct to celebrate or, or, or yeah. praise. But maybe it's coming more now. Uh, as, as one does age, you start thinking about uh, things. It's better to be grateful than to be bitter, you know. Uh, uh, and, uh, Bitterness is unbecoming. It is unbecoming. <laughs> and, uh, and if you really think about it, hardly any of us have anything to be bitter about because we're all alive uh, in this room. So, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I find myself more inclined. But I've always been inclined to praise a certain degree, but maybe more now. Yeah. Uh, do anything like that? I thought that was a. That answer. Okay. Is there another question? Uh huh. Do you think you have a pretty good idea of what your shadows are? What it is that you're resisting? I'm just kind of curious. You, you had trouble, Thomas. You had trouble with algebra or calculus or whatever, and you needed tutoring. And if you've got so much science in your palm. William Burroughs, biographer, was in town a couple weeks ago, and of course his infamous incident of shooting his wife in the head, and yet then later in life, he ends up filling up balloons with paint and blasting them with a shotgun, which I just found pretty fascinating. Shadow. Uh, I'm not quite sure what you're asking or if I should be discussing that list with anyone other than a psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> and you probably are. Uh, uh, it's true. The shadow, uh, that's a Jungian thing, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't have a, I, I'm a prodigious reader. I read huge amounts of just about everything, except fiction. I don't read, or I have read, read any novels, but I read huge amounts of history, nonfiction, poetry, of course. I read a lot of biographies, uh, but I don't, I don't know about the shadow. I, uh, I, don't, I don't know particularly what it is that, that haunts me, or uh, I don't know. Maybe that's why we write, to try to find, find that out. Uh, Got a shadow? Shadow. The shadow. Uh, the shadow is. Uh, I have a lot of. I have a lot of uh, a guilt about writing about my my mother. But is it a? Sh I mean, is she a shadow? I keep. I do write about her. It's not something I'm avoiding. Um, I think as I get further and further away from the the event of her death. Uh, I feel more and more strange about writing about it as if it's someone else's story. And uh, it's, it's the thing that continues to drive me to write, and yet I feel more and more distant from it as I, as I move further away. So, um, I don't know, writing about the, the actual event, getting closer to the event, the actual, you know, uh, what happened, that is uh, difficult for me. It's always been difficult for me, but I think... I, I feel like the best work comes from being closer to it, but it's it's also the hardest thing. So, uh, yeah. All right. Well, that's a good note to end on. If you have any more questions, I'm sure both these poets will be able to stick around for a few minutes. Um, I would like to thank, of course, uh, both of our poets for uh, reading here with us tonight. I'd also like to thank the Missouri Humanities Council for letting us put this on our website and uh, archiving this for those of you who are not able to attend. Um, hi to you all watching this. Um, <laughs> and I would also, thanks, thanks Chris. <laughs> um, I would also like to thank the Tavern for letting us do this for two seasons now since we've moved from Duff, so thank you Tavern. And then of course I'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, and don't forget that our next reading and the last one of this season is April 21st, uh, featuring members of the St. Louis Poetry Center, some of whom are even here, I believe. Hooray! <laughs> um, and then that will wrap up our 39th season. So uh, then we have our Hungry Young Poets. Uh, so we'll see you that. And then we'll start season number 40. So we will see you for all those, I hope. Thanks and good night.